welcome to another episode of Paris and Baz Cast. This week we are joined by Manjot Singh from West Hill Partners. Hey guys. Hello, welcome, welcome on our show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and uh, we're talking about the topic of discussion is federal budget and its impact on property buyers. Uh, so we're talking a few different uh, demographics or different buyer categories. So first home buyers, investors and um, owner occupiers and whether there are any significant changes for those. So we'll be discussing that. So I'll pass it over to you to start the conversation. So thank you for coming today. Thank um, you. Taking your time out. So basically just give us a brief uh, introduction about yourself, what you do. Yes, yeah, certainly. So first of all, thanks for having me, guys. Um, so I'm a chartered accountant, I'm director at West Hill Partners, which is a small um, chartered accounting firm. Yep. So we offer a range of services from accounting, tax, um, you've got your advisory as well and other compliance. And we offer these services um, to a variety of client structures, including individuals, high net worth individuals, um, companies, trusts, partnerships, SMSFs. So yeah, pretty broad in that sense. Very yeah. good, very good. So in a nutshell for our audience, the federal budget, yeah. how can you explain in layman terms basically? Yeah, I think the best way to put it is let's um, look at it in a terms of a household budget. Mm -hmm. So you may have a household budget um, and on a yearly basis you will plan for your spending. So the goods and services that you need, mm -hmm. um, you require and the goods and services that you wish to enjoy. Now you will put a dollar value to that expenditure. Um, you will take that dollar value of expenditure away from your dollar value of income and determine what's left over. So if we're left over with a negative amount, that's called a deficit mm -hmm. um, in terms of economics. Mm -hmm. And if you're left with a positive amount, that's called a surplus. Now, if you're in the de deficit you, and you don't want to stay there, you want to bring yourself back into the surplus, you either reduce your spending mm -hmm. um, or you increase your income mm -hmm. or you do both. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. um, Or you may even stay in the deficit for the shorter term mm -hmm. just because um, there, the expenditure you can't really avoid. Mm -hmm. And you will then fund that deficit um, by, by, of course, getting credit cards and loans. Mm. So that's what the federal government does on a yearly basis, mm. pretty much. Mm. So they come up with their plans of spending and their plans of income. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Income, obviously, you know, mainly comes from your taxes and duties mm. and uh, um, other sources, of course, but these are the major ones. Mm. Um, spending, they could um, decide to spend on infrastructure, they could decide to spend on public um, hospitals, you know, you've got your schools as well, or even the property market, okay, mm. depending on what they think is in the best interest mm. of everyone living in this country, mm. and in the best interest of the economy. Mm. So if the government is left in the deficit, they'll have to obviously fund that they borrow about, you know, money from the banks, which eventually taxpayers pay the interest on anyways, Yeah. right, or they could, um, leave themselves in the surplus, which means they've got the extra capacity mm. to do extra things, mm. you know, extra cash reserves mm. um, for unexpected events or um, something that they haven't planned for. So mm. I guess that's it pretty much in a nutshell. Yep. So, right. for those so with the federal budget being announced, there's a lot of talk and whatnot, especially in the property investor market. Mm. Uh, what implications are there in terms of CGT or negative gearing? These are two hot topics um, coming up. So if you want to give a uh, brief explanation in regards to that. Yes, so um, the, the CGT implications and the negative gearing implications, they, are, um, they mainly apply or they affect, I guess, the investor side of the market. Mm. Okay, I think we'll, um, before we get on to what exactly has been announced, mm. okay, um, because that's more of a, you know, a policy by the mm. Labour government. And it is a policy that's yet to be implemented, so of it's course, not something yeah. that's uh, set in stone. Yeah. And even with the budget overall, yes, it is a proposal, but it still needs to be passed. So depending on who comes in government, there may yeah. be changes on what it actually happens. Yeah, happens. so exactly right. The, the budget even, you know, it's, it's got to go through those cycles. It's got to go through the, the Senate. Bills. The bills have to be passed and mm. um, everything like that. Mm. So we'll touch on um, what the Labor policy um, is looking at doing if they come into government. Mm. But talking about the um, federal government that was announced, um, you know, a couple of months ago, um, in terms of investors now, there is no real direct impact. There is no real direct incentive or direct benefit to investors that's been announced, mm. okay? Yeah. Mm. Um, Peter, I've got it here, Peter Kulisos, the chairman of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, mm. he is saying that it's a very uneventful budget for investors, mm. okay, in the sense that 
investors play a key role in the market. Um, yeah. Of course, you guys know that. Mm. Um, they not only provide rental accommodation, mm. but um, at a later stage in their lives, you know, they access. They don't have. They don't have to access aged care pension because they can become self-funded retirees mm. own, because they own an investment Which property. Which is a major cost to the. Of course, to and um, so yeah. that's obviously helpful for the bottom line of the budget. Mm. Okay, that's a fair point. Okay, yeah. mm. but. Um, adding on to that, we do need to, I believe, understand uh, um, what are the indirect measures mm. being put into place mm. to help not only investors but pretty much everyone in the market. Yeah. Okay. Now, so I'll briefly go over these. So you've got the um, infrastructure funding first of all. Mm. Okay. They've announced a hundred billion dollar spend mm. on infrastructure over the course of the next decade. Mm. So the first one is targeting congestion. The urban congestion fund has been quadrupled from one billion mm. to four billion dollars, and I I think mm. that this Norwest um, rail link is be. probably a mm. part of that as well. Mm. Yeah. So what that's obviously doing, it's improving access to public transport. It's taking thousands of cars off the road, mm. and there are various road um, projects in place there as well. Mm. Um, adding on to that, there's rail spending. Now, th this is a this is an important one. Um, because this is, I think, creating some sort of shifts in the market. Okay, mm. so the government is planning on creating very fast rail links mm. between Sydney and Newcastle, mm. so your other smaller cities close by to a major city, mm. between Melbourne and Geelong, between Brisbane and um, the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast. Mm. Okay, so what they're trying to do there is they're trying to, um, I would say, unlock potential in regional areas. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, and that's in line, we won't touch on it, but that's in line with the migration policy. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And the so commuting time is getting hard or... So, yeah. um, so it's stimulating the activity in those regional areas yes. to encourage more There's demand from investors. Yes. So uh, more demand from investors who can't pay too much of a price, mm. but do still want an investment property. Mm. They can probably you know, go to yeah. these regional areas, purchase a property, mm. and the, the government is obviously saying that you know, once those areas start booming, mm. then your rental yields, your rates of return, mm. and your um, capital gains mm. um, would be pretty much, um, would, would won't be much different to what mm. you see in, in the cities. Mm. Okay, so, so, so th there is a shift, it's in line with the migration policy, you know, and um, I think on an international level, all major cities of the world mm. have adopted this style as well when yeah. you know you've got heavy congestion in one city yeah so you... you know i was in japan years ago you could visit from uh, a place that if you were um, in australia it'll take you three hours but over there it takes 45 minutes mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so if you do have that connectivity to employment zones mm -hmm. then why not manage um, population growth mm -hmm. in, in a way um, where you do shift people across to um, regional areas Adding on to that, um, so that's the infrastructure. The other thing that they're telling us is um, they've announced a $7.1 billion surplus, yeah. and that's for the first time in 12 years. Mm -hmm. okay, the, that's, that's massive. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's another good point. So mm -hmm. the budget has always been, um, for the last 12 years, in the deficit. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the government has had to borrow, yeah. but um, now they're planning a $7.1 billion surplus. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what that means is they've got the extra capacity to do more, yeah. whether they want to do it on um, infrastructure or other essential services. Mm. Okay, mm. so um, I personally believe yes, this is an indirect impact once again, mm. but I don't think that it's a direct impact mm. in the sense that you've got a budget surplus. Mm. You know that that you're not like yes, you will do all these um, investments and whatnot to encourage the investor mm. to investing in a certain market. Mm. But what really stimulates um, the confidence and stimulates the um, um, confidence and also the um, activity, in activity in the housing market is the mm. spending. Mm. So consumer if, confidence of course, important. consumer confidence. So if they have an app, if the consumer, the investor has an appetite for spending, mm. that I think has a knock-on effect on the housing prices. And what may stimulate it mm. is your personal um, tax cuts or yeah. your business tax cuts, which I can think we can touch on at the end of the conversation, yeah. um, or um, if they've got policies for wage growth, mm. so that, all, all, all that sort of stuff um, really um, yeah, stimulates the investor. So in a nutshell, so we've talked about investors, so there's not much there, but in, in terms of direct measures, there's indirect measures, and um, I think, um, I personally think they're good measures. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah.
And is there anything in particular for first home buyers or owner occupiers? Any policy changes or anything that yes, yeah, so them? so that yeah, that leads on to our next discussion. Mm. Now, again, there's um, no direct incentive for first home buyers. It might come as a surprise, mm. but they're saying you know the house prices are already low, so mm. the confidence um, of first home buyers is already there, and you can share your thoughts on that as well. Yeah. Mm. So look, there is a correction in the market, um, mm. but basically. I think the prices are, have leveled out. I think mm. um, the activity is back in, in, in the market. Um, mm. There's not much stock available on the market as well. At the mm. moment, I think with elections coming up and whatnot. Mm. Mm. But look, first time buyers, I think it's the it's the best time to buy now um, mm. if they ever been wanted to buy in the last mm. couple of years. Mm. Um, but but that's, that's what we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, mm. so once uh, once again, Peter Kuliusos, who I've um, read up on, um, the chairman from the Property Investment Professionals in Australia, mm. he's saying that, um, yes, you do, really need to encourage first home buyers as well mm. yeah. and there's no real direct encouragement yeah, here there's, there's mm. no incentive um, that's been provided here that's mm. what we're you saying. know research yeah. shows we've got it here that in the past 12 to 18 months mm. they've been the one source of growth mm. in yeah. the market mm. um, um, boosting the economy mm. okay yeah. so if their confidence decreases yeah. okay um, there's no real incentive if if we do see i don't know if that's going to create a great impact yeah. but um there, but we're seeing with the, with the uh, credit squeeze a bit yeah. tightening in the lending that's mm. also not helping mm. um, yeah. but the other thing that my observation is that a lot of first home buyers are being quite particular with their requirements they may have a list of 10 points that all have mm -hmm. to match when they are buying but mm -hmm. what we are encouraging our buyers out there is that when they are attending open homes is that take your top three and focus on those mm -hmm. and if you find those go for it because obviously a, um, uh, a approval a pre-approval is lasting you six months so mm -hmm. a lot of the times those six months are lapsing they're not finding a property they're not making a decision mm -hmm. and by the time you go to reapply again, there are some changes in assessment uh, from a this, uh, finance point of view, yeah. which um, makes a difference of how much you can borrow against. So it makes a makes a difference in that regard. So yeah. if from a another point that we also mention is that where our opinion is that we're reaching that equilibrium in the market where the vendors are not selling below a certain amount, depending on obviously their circumstances, and the buyers are not coming up. So there is that sort of equilibrium of, okay, well, this is now the new um, norm, this is now the new prices, yeah. and this is what it's indicating that we are at that sort of lower end or at the bottom end of the market. Yeah, and mm -hmm. when that point is reached, we know the market has basically bottomed out. That's right. Um, yeah. That's and look, every is suburb is different. Yeah. Um, and what we are also finding is that if they are unique properties, um, they're, they're a bit of an anomaly in, in, the, in the, uh, the prices that are being achieved. But in general, what we are seeing is that a number of suburbs are leveling out and bottoming out. So now is a good time to buy. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, a, I think, um, just so adding on to that. Mm. So house prices have come low. Yeah. You know, there's been declines and the corrections that were meant to be made have already been made, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I think now is the point where you can't let house prices fall further mm. um, to a point where they create dangerous risks mm. for the state of the economy. Mm. Yeah. And this is why when that, now let's touch on that, when the labour policy was announced with yeah. negative gearing and capital gains, mm. um, this is why some of the analysts were saying this is going to um, um, cool a market which is already cool. so cool. cool. That's right. It's it's being <laughs> it's, it's being announced way. at the yeah. bad time. Yeah. yeah. It, the timing. It, the policy so, is the policy. Yeah. But the so timing. the policy itself. So negative gearing. Um, will, which um, you guys. I think Arjun came the other day. Yeah. On, from Investor Kid, he discussed that with you guys. So where you're you're allowed to um, have your expenses be. I mean, not allowed to have your expenses, but where your expenses are more than your income, your rental income, and the property expenses are more, mm. you're able to, able to deduct those against your other income. Mm. So, tax you, so yeah. taxable income, mm. and um, then you then you obviously get a tax benefit. Mm. And the capital gains policy, if you come to sell your property, you've held it on for at least a year. Mm. You know, whereas um, currently it's being um, taxed at 50 percent mm. so 50 percent of the capital gain is being taxed mm. labor wants to reduce that to 25 percent mm. okay mm. Um, with negative gearing they want to abolish it altogether for existing properties mm -hmm. okay and only keep it for new properties, new properties. but mm. they will be um, grandfathering which means um, if you've already holding investment property mm. um, you will be still allowed to 
um, negatively gi mm. in terms of tax. Mm. But interesting thing is, um, even if it's allowed on new um, properties, mm. then that new properties at a later stage does get sold. Yeah. Then you've got a buyer coming in, mm. buying an existing property mm. yeah. who is not able to negatively Negative um, yep. so, so the what they're saying is that is going to reduce demand. How much of it is being uh, going to be reduced? We don't know. Yeah. Okay, um, everything is uncertain and certain, you yeah. know, ec in economics. Yeah. Um, but um, experts were saying that yes, um, with lower demand, you know, um, for housing and um, the prices are going to be. Decreased Just further. We're seeing open hands mm. investors are basically out of the game at the moment. Mm. We're seeing, yeah. yeah. So if you're changing the um, returns on after tax um, housing for investors, but you're not changing anything for the occupiers, yeah. so the occupier has the same incentive to mm. buy that house as the investor, mm. but the investor doesn't want to buy it anymore, mm. right? Because yeah. he can't negatively. So it's leave. not attractive to the. So the property yeah. still exists, mm. but there's no demand, and then that could push um, house prices further. Mm. There's the argument that um, rental prices mm. might go up, mm -hmm. okay? And that's, uh, again, forces of supply and demand. Mm. Um, if there's no rental property and the demand is there for rental mm. property, mm. the that's prices will go up. Mm. And, but recently, some analysts have been saying that that may end up being a correction mm. because um, those rental properties, if they become vacant, mm. You know, then first home buyers might enter that market. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, you do have less rental properties, but at the same time, you have less renters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, but at the end of the day, um, mm -hmm. there there is going to there is a risk yeah. out there yeah. that yeah. it is going to reduce Obviously in the cooling market. In the cooling yeah. market, house prices for they it would make sense. I think three or four years ago, yeah. when um, you know there was a massive boom, and you want to reduce that boom, yeah. boom you could. Implement those strategies. Time where the market has cooled and it's been bank led. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, again, coming back to Peter Kulusos, he says instead of um, helping first home buyers mm -hmm. in the way where you're trying to, you know, shift things around, so first home buyers have access as well, where you implement this negative gearing and capital ga um, mm -hmm. gains. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing that, because that affects the investors, mm -hmm. then the government could look at other measures, mm. such as opening up the FHOG. And I'm going to quote here. Mm. He goes, while restricting the grant to new properties, mm. um, that was no doubt a strategy to assist the construction sector. Mm. It's a very difficult to make housing more affordable for all when you're only focusing on just 2% of the market. Mm. So state governments, federal governments, they should extend the first home owner's grant mm. to include established properties as well. Mm. Um, yeah. Because the grant is only there on um, new properties. Yeah, it's on existing properties or up to six fifty. Okay. And there's a concession between six fifty and eight hundred. Mm. Yeah. 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 So um, that's that. Um, you know, and touching back, going back to our um, where we started. Mm. Yeah. So these first home buyers now also have an incentive if those infrastructure plans come in place. Mm. You have your regional areas; they have the incentive. If they can't afford something here, mm. they could be able to afford it in regional areas and still have access to Sydney or all the other yeah, major cities. Yeah. Which, which makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So I'll just say hello to a few people. So we've got Rani, Rups, Anuj, Jason, Rupinder, Luke. Thanks, Luke, for some of the questions and uh, comments that you've made indirectly. That's correct. Yep. Thank you for watching. That's, that's great feedback there. We've got Instagram Live there as well. Yep. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Do you have any questions? Uh, nothing, I believe. So Sydney, Western Sydney and affordable markets won't be as affected, I feel. Thanks for your observation, Luke. Perfect. Okay. So, so just one thing, um, um, guys. Um, would like to touch on as well is yeah. now there's no direct financial stimuli for owner occupiers as well yeah okay um owner occupiers would like to see their prices go up prices are low yeah but there's no other measures being announced um as such where they where they could feel their prices would go up yeah. so but i think again the indirect especially the the personal income tax cuts mm. and i'm um, just going to briefly go through those mm. and um the business tax cuts as well that are being planned um, so, at a personal level, there's increases in the maximum benefit of the low and middle income tax offset mm. from $530 um, to $1,080 for single. So, your tax offset, if you're a low income owner, mm. that's planned to be doubled. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, and uh, obviously, that you times that by two for dual income families. Mm. Okay. 
um, increase in the top threshold of the 19% um, bracket. Mm -hmm. So the 19% tax rate currently applies if you're earning up to $37,000. Mm. That's due to be increased to 45. So okay. people uh, who are earning between the 35 to 37,000 to the 45,000 um, yeah. Um, you know, figure. Yeah. They will be able to access um, mm -hmm. that nineteen percent as well. Mm. You know, and there will be a decreased marginal tax rate of thirty percent for Australians earning forty five thousand dollars to two hundred thousand dollars from first of July twenty twenty four. Okay. So okay. that's a great reduction there. Mm. So obviously, like we discussed earlier, if you've got such tax cuts. You know, and there's a mm. few for businesses as well, mm. then that is increasing your appetite in spending because you will have extra money in your pocket. Yeah. Okay. And the other one, um, um, you probably know this one, Gurdiv, um, there was a $2 billion package announced for small and medium businesses for better access to funding. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So yeah. small and medium businesses can access funding and... Um, which I think is an indirect boost for yeah, many. For the businesses, mm. for the SMEs. Yeah, yeah because um, uh, right now what they're doing is um, small to medium businesses, they're using their home equity to... to, to especially if you're starting... Mm. starting to, um, yeah, yeah. Of course, to invest um, further in their have, businesses. Yeah. Mm. So instead of them using that equity to be business purposes, where okay, they could use that e equity elsewhere mm. yeah. um, to grow their investment portfolios, mm. um, there are other measures being planned um, where they could access, have access to more funding, easier funding than just your equity. Yeah. Great yeah. for someone starting yeah. their business. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so also guess, putting a lot of money um, in your pocket, mm. which you currently don't have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess in a nutshell, to summarise the impact of the federal budget on those three groups. So we've touched that for owner occupiers is not in not enough direct impact. That yeah. direct impact. For first-home buyers and for investors, there is an indirect impact where the in infrastructure spending is increasing, which yep. you are hoping would stimulate the demand for regional areas mm -hmm. for them to be starting to invest or purchase in those areas, which then thereby, once the investors are spending there, would increase um, rentals as well if of the course. demand increases. So mm -hmm. that's the impact that we have seen. So, yeah, so the in intention is clear. Yeah. Um, the intention is to... Um, not affect the market in a way where people do step out. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They hold on. They stay in the market, but they change their priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they, if, if you know, instead of investing in Sydney, you're investing in regional, mm -hmm. and that's they're trying to manage population growth better. Yeah. Which I personally think is a is a is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much for joining us. That's uh, Thank you great. so much. Uh, and if there are any questions afterwards as well, feel free to uh, send them through. We'll be uh, happy to answer them for you. Um, and uh, just a reminder, this is going to be a regular um, cast, a, a live stream that we would be doing on Thursdays at 3 p.m. If there are any other businesses out there um, that want to come join us, feel free to get in touch with us. We'll be more than happy to have your views on um, topics that affect property management, sales or finance as well, the three things that we do. Um, for next week, we've got Sabine Afani from uh, Before You Bid talking about uh, the, uh, um, the, purchase, the purchasing of um, building and pest reports before you purchase a property. So that's coming up next week. We also have a few other exciting guest speakers that are just confirming their availability. So we will announce them as we get that. Um, so again, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Thank and you so thank much. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you guys well next time. Thanks. Thank